where I put my glass. Okay. And we're live, ladies and gentlemen. Good day, whiskey brothers and sisters. We are honored to have you, the viewer, and our panel with us here tonight. My name's Dolph. I am the president of the Alberta Scotch Society and founder of the Whiskey Book Club. For those uh, who are new to us, I'm going to explain a little bit what we're about. We are, first and foremost, a group of whiskey geeks that love to share a dram and share our passion for reading, mostly about whiskey and whiskey-related activities. Uh, beyond that, uh, our society's initial book, if, if we go back in the past, and, and this relates to Davin very well, so here's book number one. This was our inaugural book, Davin's Canadian Whiskey, The New Portable Expert, second edition. <laughs> and also, one of the two books we're going to promote for buying fathers on Father's Day in a week and a day. Over those seven weeks, Davin at our virtual side, we had access to his vast knowledge of the subject. We developed our knowledge of Canadian whiskey and the history behind it. And it was a fantastic time. We fell in love with Davin. Nick up there in the corner had to come back because she's Davin's favorite, I think we figured out during those times. Oh, I've been trying to be discreet. Oh, I, think, I don't think you're good. You like it. And our second book, our second book was uh, an autobiography, possibly by the most well-known whiskey commentator right now, Ralphie. So we studied and talked about this book, Ralphie's Search for a Whiskey Bothy. And we did it for four weeks. It was a quick, but it was a good read. Our present home, though, why we're all here tonight, is this book. And what brought us here tonight, we were initially inspired by our sense of adventure and my long desire to do the whiskey trail or the bourbon trail. Uh, and I thought Canada has so much history so much whiskey why do we not have our own trail so we we're, we're calling this canadian whiskey journey because i think we need a different name than they do in the states or they do in england not england scotland Ooh, sorry so the uh, the idea for this became more focused the more we spoke with davin in our first book club um, um, and this the newest release davin it was april 1st was it not uh, yeah, March 30th this year. March. Oh, sorry. I was off. So this, yeah. The Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries, the second book you should all get for daddies in a week and a day, co-written with Blair Phillips. So, no. And uh, it contains all the information, absolutely everything you are going to need to actually do your own Canadian whiskey journey if you want to do it. So thanks to Devin and Blair's book, we have the direction we need. Uh, the inside track that we all crave to do this. And, and what they become for us, Davin and Blair, is our spirit guides on this journey. And that's a great name. Our, not spiritual. They didn't like that. There's our spirit guides on this journey as we cross this big, beautiful country of ours. So this all fits perfectly with the Whiskey Book Club's second foci, which is... The camaraderie that comes with sharing a dram, that comes with sharing an adventure together. Uh, and I know we can't start this in person right now, but just like everything else, let's be content with the online experience. Let's go on our cross Canada trip and get better acquainted with the myriad of distilleries across this fantastic country of ours. And here we are. So we will, as in all previous weeks continue afterwards with our more relaxed after dram and it starts about five minutes uh after the broadcast so without further ado let's do our round table introductions with the names and platform handles of everyone on our panel and if you could also tell us what's in your dram so we all decided on the prospect of rye but how do you have your rye is it neat is it on the rocks water is it inside of a cocktail and let's start with Davin, please. Oh, you're you're muted. Are you unmuted? Hi, hi, I'm I'm Davin de Kurgemont. I'm drinking Prospector Rye Neat in a in a whiskey glass. 
uh, Blair and I wrote this uh, this book, uh, Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I want to say a special thanks to Dolph for organizing the book club and for uh, having us as his guests. Thanks, Dolph. You're so welcome. And let's go. Oh, it's going to be Blair. <laughs> we'll figure one out. Hi, Blair Phillips, co-author of uh, The Definitive Guide to Canadian Distilleries. I'm enjoying a Manhattan with uh, some Prospector Rye. Excellent. <laughs> Andy Gordon. Hi there. Um, I'm Gordon Glenz. I'm the, the, the founder and distiller at Odd Society Spirits. Um, super happy to be here to be included with this and, and excited for the evening. I'm enjoying um, a Prospector Rye Neat, um, which we make in the back. <laughs> on the premise hi there i'm nicole or i also go by nick and you can find me on instagram at black cat whiskey and i'm enjoying um, prospector rye as well neat <laughs> all righty and i'm gonna set the scene for us tonight if i may so we have arrived at our inaugural spot of our Canadian whiskey journey, and we meet up with someone that we admire, Davin de Caljumeau. Davin, I, I can't say it without the French accent, I'm sorry. My uh, grandfather would just love to hear you say my name. Okay, well, Davin de Caljumeau, I'm really happy, and his <laughs> co-author friend, Blair Phillips. Now, Nick and I have been to Vancouver, but we've never, definitely never been to this gem of a distillery, the Odd Spirits, Odd Society Spirits. And we got a picture of it on there as well, so we're going to throw that up when we can. But we know Davin, and he's agreed to get us this top-notch tour with Joshua, the owner no less. So imagine that. Gordon. How happy are we to be there with Gordon? Did I say jo I said Joshua? Sorry. No, Gordon. Jordan is the man, and he's showing us around. And I better not say anything wrong because we won't get the tour that we're looking forward to. <laughs> uh, the questions and conversation that's going to follow is that of four people meeting up and doing this once-in-a-lifetime tour with the founder, the owner. So I'm going to start this off, though, because and, and we're going to have the chance to talk to Davin and Blair over the next 15 weeks about the book, but I really do want to start with questions to them. So, uh, Gavin, first question, or Blair, why are we starting in BC? And why is the book separated in three sections? In I BC? think, um, <laughs> yeah, the, the epicenter, uh, ground zero of, of distilling in Canada is definitely British Columbia. And um, when we were working on the book and compiling a list of distilleries, um, it became obvious that um, the province was too big cram into one section. So it made sense to divide them up into um, the Vancouver and Vancouver area distilleries, uh, Vancouver Island, and then uh, the Okanagan Valley. And that's why we broke up in those three sections. Excellent. And why are we starting in Vancouver right now, Blair? Why did you pick Vancouver as our very big stop, our first one? Um, I think it's because it's uh, the first in the book. So right. we might as well, well go in the same order. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Next question. And so we know that you've worked together on the travel and whiskey adventure series, which is in whiskey magazine, but, and, and you know each other, your friends, but when did you solidify your relationship enough that you knew that you could both write a book together? Cause that's gotta be stressful. It's gotta be a daunting task to be able to get together and write and both be just as creative and not step on each other's toes. When did you decide that you were solid enough to do that? <laughs> I, I think um, if, if I were to pinpoint a, a definite time for that, um, we had been working on Whiskey Magazine since about uh, July 2013, I think was the first issue. And it was about two years after that that we were in Newfoundland together. And uh, we just started Patting, uh, passing back the idea of doing a book together, uh, going to all these distilleries in Newfoundland and then Alberta, uh, Vancouver Island, Ontario. It just started to all make sense and all lock into place. Perfect. <laughs> all right. And Devin, do you concur with that story? 
Well, I, I don't really know what Bubbler's talking about. Uh, I hired him to know. <laughs> no, just kidding. I met Blair at the launch of my first book. He had okay. been in, he worked, he was working on Drinking Made Easy at the time, TV show in the States. And, and he had interviewed me about lot number 40. And then, then uh, I said, hey, you know, I'm launching a book, but you come to my, to my book launch. He showed up with Lena, his wife, and uh, we chatted a little bit and uh, we just started corresponding back and forth. I don't know when it really came together that we should work as a team, but it, it became pretty clear that he, first of all, asked intelligent questions and that uh, he really knew a lot about whiskey and had a very well uh, um, yeah, tuned palate. So we just started kind of, you know, we kind of got working together and then we got on Whiskey Magazine together and we did a few tours, uh, you know, distillery tours for, for the magazine. And, uh, you know, it just seemed to, we seemed to, to work well together. I remember in, in, Blair lives in Toronto. I live in Ottawa. And uh, one time he was in um, Ottawa visiting his folks. We went out to the, the Mill, uh, Mill Street uh, restaurant and uh, started talking about doing a, a book. And it just seemed to make really good sense. So. You know, and then we were traveling all over the place. Might as well put it all together into one package. It just got, uh, just got more and more interesting, more and more uh, desirable. So, and yeah, working with somebody else can really be a really big pain in the neck. Um, if if that, they're not the right person. If that, if that's not the right person, that's right. Because you know, writers have egos, and you know, you, you, we <laughs> we really need to deal with each other and you know, things like that. But we seem to be very compatible, and and our words really fit well together. You can't tell in this book, I don't think, which sections I wrote and which sections Blair wrote, because we each rewrote each other's work. So it's, a, yeah, it's a it's a, a really good partnership, I think. Fantastic, mm -hmm. and I'm really happy that you did. Or we wouldn't have this book right in front of us. <laughs> One person couldn't write this book. <laughs> and it's a beautiful tome. And we're going to talk about that tons. But let's get Gordon involved a little bit right now. Gordon, you opened in 2013. Uh, did you open before the craft production agreement or BCs? Or did that enable you to open up? Um, we actually started... Um, in 2012, getting getting it rolled, it took about 16 months before we were able to open. So we opened, actually, we always say our anniversary is Halloween 2013. Oh, nice. Um, we started 16 months before that. So we actually started, we were just totally naive. Um, there was no craft agreement. Um, we just wanted to start an distillery. And, um, and we it was just a bit, you know, it was serendipity and we sort of, changed our focus um, when all the new craft rules came out. Um, we had to sort of sit down and think of uh, the direction of the distillery and we did end up changing it from, originally we had, all, we had one of the things we wanted to do originally was to do rum because we're really close to Roger Sugar. Like, you know, we're sitting distance from Roger Sugar and we thought, hey, you know, it makes sense to do rum. But, you know, once the craft rules came out, um, um, we realized that, you know, we would stick to BC ingredients and, uh, yeah, went from there. You're okay back there? All good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was Miriam. <laughs> well, and we're going to have Miriam on in the after dram. And, uh, Nick, let's get you involved here for, for trips to BC. I know you like to travel, to look, find your whiskey. You do that throughout Alberta. You go on road trips to try and find the perfect bottle, the Dusties, the Unicorns. Have you ever been to BC? And I, as far as Vancouver? I've been to BC. Um, I've never actually looked at whiskey in Vancouver. Um, mm. The biggest sort of uh, stop for that was the price and dealing with the sales tax and not actually knowing what was there. So it's kind of interesting reading this book and having this tour across the country because I didn't know what we had locally. Oh, I agree. In our own backyard, much less in BC. And mm -hmm. when you read the book and you find out the third of the distilleries are in BC, uh, I was a bit shocked. I would have, well, I assumed that for Ontario but and then maybe ontario quebec but definitely not bc so i'm there with you nick i i was a bit surprised uh gordon going back to the agreement is does it help or hinder you that you have to use bc ingredients i i think it it 
overall, I think it helps. I think it, it helps to sort of define, you know, our industry here in BC. I think it helps to, um, to have people know exactly what they're getting. I think, um, you know, I think in general, the rules have been, been very favorable. Um, you know, I, I guess we could get into it later, but there's some things, it, it is a bit restrictive so that, for example, um, for now, there's no peated malts that we could use, you know, to make a peated whiskey. Um, there's no, you know, so we're very much restricted um, in terms of what's available in BC, but but as time goes on, um, that's changing and more is available. So. so where do you get your peated malt then? Because you do make a smoked and a peated single malt. Are you allowed to go outside of BC if they don't have the product? So um, it's a bit of a story and uh, we, we are sourcing, um, we're trying to source BC peat, but we have created a method that we use for a lot of things now, which was a way to deal with this rule. So as you mentioned, and as I said, everything to be a craft distillery, the malt has to be grown in BC. For our peated malt, we use heavily peated Baird's malt from Scotland. So it's kind of like, how are we allowed to do that? So when we developed a method where, believe it or not, um, we don't use peated malt when we're mashing. You know, we, 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 we mash it and then we use um, the peated malt in our gin basket in the final distillation. So we, we, we run the spirit through the gin basket, which pulls out these incredible peat flavors, and then we throw that malt away. So technically, we haven't used it to make the alcohol. So in the same way that you would use um, lemons to make gin. Okay. And um, so what we found was um, we use a lot less malt, like one tenth of the malt we normally need to use. We get incredible flavors, and we also just um, uh, were able to clean our equipment. Uh, one little basket instead of cleaning an entire distillery if we had to do a, a run of vodka after a peated run. So um, it's just turned into this really effective, efficient method for working with, with, with malts. Excellent. Uh, Blair and Davin, because you guys have been cross country. I know that there's peat made in Saskatchewan. And can you think of, because uh, Glenn Breton, gets their peat from Saskatchewan. Can you tell me any other places in our country that does peat? Well, yeah. Shelter Point. They, mature the, they mature the whiskey in Lafroy casks. Yeah. So that's where the peat comes from. And now uh, Douglas is doing the same thing. Okay. Pemberton, Pemberton Distillery in British Columbia has been making their own peated malt for five <laughs> years now. For five years they've been making it. And they dig the peat right on their own property. Tyler Schramm, uh, maybe you can get him to peat some for you, Gordon. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. out in uh, in um, New Brunswick, mm -hmm. you have um, uh, Fils du Roi. So Seb Sebastian Roy, you probably say his name better yeah. than I do. He's uh, also uh, peating his own uh, malt. He's, and he's peating rye as well, again, using peat that, that he digs on his own property. So yeah, people are starting to do that. There's no reason. And we're, we're, well, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, we also, uh, we've started getting some peat from Washington State. They have um, uh, a Skagit Valley malting does peated malt from using local Washington peat. So okay. we've been using that as well. Is that from Westland or one developed by Westland? So uh, Westland uses the same uh, peated malt. Um, it, it's all done by, by Skagit Valley Malting, yes. Oh. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, my question's to you, uh, Gordon, again. So I, I seem to be focusing on you a lot, but I, haven't, I, I try to read up on you. And Blair, I've seen stuff. And Davin, I've seen tons. And Nick knows whiskey better than i do so i don't talk to her as much because we talk a lot <laughs> we very well uh, but you have a master of science from uh was it harriet watt university in edinburgh so you worked yes you did that it's master of science in brewing and distilling is that correct and yes, then that's you worked at spring bank so um 
the, the Springbank part was very short. So, so um, Harriet Watt has a very well-known uh, program, and and um, I think half the distillers in Scotland have gone to Harriet Watt, um, and it's been around for a hundred years. Um, so I did that program, and then when I was done. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think you're frozen, Gordon. It's a dramatic pause. <laughs> I said, I contacted Springbank and all these distilleries and said, hey, you know, could I do like a practicum, a student practicum? Oh. And I, the only distillery that I heard from was, was Springbank. And they said, yeah, come on down. And so what it was is I spent a week following the distiller and, and just, just hanging out at, at, at Springbank. And it was the most amazing thing um, when I went there. Um, you know, I was I was going to um, set up in a hotel, and um, uh, Frank McCarty, who who was running Springbank at the time, he comes to me and says, "Oh, Gordon," he says, "Here's the key to the company flat." So he took me downtown and says, "Here's the keys to the company flat. Um, you come whenever you want." And it, they were just so incredibly um, welcoming, and it was just. Uh, one of the most amazing weeks so i mean i have always will and always have had a soft spot for spring band you know i can't i can't say enough about, about that whole experience <laughs> so if nick and i both go to spring bank and offer our services they'll give us a job and we'll get a key to the <laughs> is that what's gonna happen <laughs> I, you know i don't know what it was you know <laughs> i'd have to bring my wife but nick this is this is an opportunity. I think this is fantastic. Let's do this. Yeah, I, I think at the time it was just good timing because they wanted to, um, I guess, get something going between Harriet Watt and maybe have students come there. Um, so so uh, they'd been thinking about it. So it was just mm -hmm. right person at the right time. Gordon, how do you end up in Vancouver then? Where's the big step from there to Canada, halfway across the world? Um, well, we were, um, we were already living in Vancouver, so uh, we had gone over there to do the masters and then had come back, um, you know, to start the distillery. So the whole idea was to go to Scotland, um, do the program, get some experience and then come back and start the distillery. Oh, so it's the grand plan. It was already in the design. So, and how was Miriam with you just giving away your talents to spring bank? She was okay with it. Well, yeah, Miriam is really, you know, she's the brains behind the operation, you know, like, you know, she, she just got tired of me talking about wanting to do this and, and she said, okay, I'm going to make it happen. So, so, uh, yeah, so I'm lucky that way. All right. And we've heard about Davin's education in the back, but we haven't heard yours, Blair. Where'd you go to school? Where'd you learn the mass amount that you do right now about whiskey and no other spirits? Because you love vodka as well. And uh, yeah, gin, vodka, liqueurs, yeah. rum, everything. Um, it's just been a hobby of mine. Um, I have a, uh, I went to school for music okay. uh, and then took some writing classes on top of that and um, fell into this because of drinking made easy, meeting Davin, reviewing his book. And uh, it, it all snowballed from there. Um, and you're obviously creative, and that helps with the process, right? Yeah, I did some copywriting for a while, um, some creative writing, that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, but but spirits is where everything started to really uh, snowball. Because um, when I got into this, uh, I was lucky because there weren't a ton of people doing Canadian whiskey. Uh, yeah. I think Davin was probably the only person. Um, so it... it it just it really helped in that sense. Perfect. And um, on our link as well, you can see some links to Davin and to Blair and to the Odd Society, Gordon, Miriam. There's tons of that down below. So after this, if you want more information, click on those links and I'll send you to the different areas that you can go to. I do need the information on your first project together. What was it called again? Uh, experience. Blair and Devin, where you were writing for Whiskey Magazine. Oh, boy. Well, I, I was the uh, contributing editor for Whiskey Magazine at the time. And uh, Blair just came on writing. We started writing together. We did some amazing things together. Like we went chasing down a, 
uh, the, finding the grave of a bootlegger in New Brunswick and getting some of this yeah. bagasse and getting some some illicit uh, booze in, in New Brunswick. And, and it was really done beautifully because we were in this little bar. Where I think it was the only bar in that town where you could you you couldn't be sure you'd get beat up and uh, <laughs> and, and um, the, you know the guy took off and disappeared and then the waitress came over recognized blair i think she thought she knew him from the the food channel or something like that she absolutely was just gaga about blair i might well i might as well not good looking guy. and then this guy walks in with this bottle you know of of this bagasse this illicit brew he had two bombs i think exactly <laughs> Gave him to us and he says, "Now I want something in return." We said, "Okay, well, we're not sure what, you know what you want in return." And we had a bottle of Crown Royal uh, Monarch with us, okay, oh, and uh, so we offered him the Monarch, and it, there was a little bit missing because we had already been out to the bootlegger's grave and we poured a little bit of Crown Royal Monarch on his grave, you know, toasted nice, him, people. toasted him in plastic glasses. Then we, so we gave this to him, and the guy said, oh, "I need more than that." I said, "Come on." That's a seventy-five dollar bottle of Crown Royal. That's not any old Crown Royal. So he said, "Fine," and and took off. And Blair, Zug Island. Tell tell them about Zug Island. Zug Island in Windsor. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. There's uh, that's where the Windsor Hum is. Um, so we were at a Canadian club, uh, and and we were chasing a ghost story actually because of all the ghost stories coming out of. Uh, of Canadian Club, and we stumbled across this weird island that um, there was a hum that comes from it that, that the people in the town can hear. But, was it but like going a back, pirate island with pirate no, staff in there, Blair? I don't know. It's it's between Detroit and Windsor, so who knows okay, what they're doing? You've got to work with me, Blair. Yeah, it's a pirate island. And <laughs> the sound is the but, sound of the, the the spirits howling or something like that. Yeah, but but speaking of the bagasse that uh, uh, that Davin was talking about, I still have a bottle of that in my basement. And really? uh, I use it to run the furnace in the winter. <laughs> it's uh, it's powerful stuff. Get that spark. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Josh. Well, is, you know, uh, Josh uh, isn't here. He's in. Uh, no, he's I'm sure Josh him. Beach is the co-owner, but he must be a silent partner. Is that correct, Gordon? Yeah. So what happened was, um, um, I met Josh Beach at Harriet Watt. He and I were. Um, students together and we finished our masters and then um i went back to vancouver and he went um he actually got a job installing breweries across the uk and um so and okay. a couple of years later he he ended up joining and becoming a partner in our society um and then he was with us for about two and a half years and then of course he went off and became distiller for the gretzky distillery and now he's moving on to um, another distillery in Ontario. Is he still owner? Or did you buy him out? Kicked him out? No, he's still he's still a silent partner at Out Society for oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. fun. Uh, when I'm, I'm guessing this is me, yours and Miriam's decision when you're looking for a location. Why did you pick where you are? And I have it on a map actually, if I could find it. So honestly. Um, uh, so where we are, if people, we're we're right by the port of Vancouver. We're in the you know uh, east, very far east Vancouver. Yep. Um, it actually was kind of just the situation, the way things worked out, forced us here because there's only about three places in the city that have the right zoning. Oh. And okay. at the time we were just looking, and and it just came up, and we had a couple of places fall through, and. Finally, this one worked, and we're, but we're absolutely thrilled at where we ended up because we have incredible support from the local community. Uh, nice. Yeah. If I was to walk from Gastown, how long would it take me to get there? You figure? Uh, it would take you about 20, 25 minutes. Oh, it's kick. Yeah. yeah, you just head straight east. and, and yeah. You're, uh, so when I leave your place tonight after all of the, well, all of the rye and my uh, – our, our, our two cocktails, that's where I'm heading? Is that where you're going to suggest that I should go? As a group, because we're taking everyone out, we're going. Yeah, um, I mean, Gastown has a lot of incredible restaurants. Um, yeah. Um, 
right now things are of course you know with the situation being what it is there's a lot of restaurants that, that are just starting to open and so um uh but gas town would be a, a good start for sure okay good and we had a question from dave yukon dave how long no did how long did it take you to do the schooling because i think a lot of people want to do exactly what you did go okay. there get their masters so, and work for the the masters uh is 12 months so you do two semesters and then you do uh, a thesis uh you know a four month thesis so it's 12 months do I need a Bachelor of Science? Because I've got a Bachelor of Education and a Master in Admin. I'm wondering, do I have to go back to school and take something? So that was really a, a pretty amazing as well. So so my I, I had a, a Bachelor of Arts, and believe it or not, I, I had a, a Master's in Translation. You know, I, I used to work as another life just completely. I, I used to work as a translator, French, English. Yeah. But um, so I applied and technically you're supposed to have a, a bachelor of science. But I think Harry, what I think in general, they do this. They said they accepted me. They said, yeah, sure, you can do it. Um, okay. If after the first semester you passed all your courses, you're fine. So you're it's kind of like a, a trial. If you can do it, you can do it. And I think right. that's just amazing. So so I did the first semester. I did all fine. And, and so so I was in you know so um if you have a bachelor of arts you know you can go for it and, yeah i think my wife's a bit worried right now because uh <laughs> i'm up for it i'm there uh, <laughs> i know that when i first went um uh there were in our in our year there were there were 28 students and now i believe uh, um, there's over 100 like like it's wow. just gone crazy with all the the nice. craft distilleries and the whole movement around the world and uh, yeah yeah, it was pretty. And I, I always I have to mention just because of some of the stuff we're doing. One of the other guys um, uh, that I went to school with became the blender for McAllen, and 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 he recently visited us and 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 and, and helped us and gave us an insight into into you know you know we had a workshop and and all that. So it, it, the biggest and best thing about Harriet Watt was 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 besides learning about distilling was all the people that you met because everybody went to all four corners of the world and gained all this thing, incredible information. Yeah. And because you established yourself in a beautiful city, in a beautiful province, people want to come visit you because if, if they were coming to Edmonton, I don't know how many people I would have along the way. Edmonton's now, beautiful. It is, but it's not Vancouver. And I'm sorry, Vancouver is beautiful. You know, I, I don't know if you know this, uh, but I was born in Edmonton oh, yeah. and raised in oh. Edmonton, and, and uh, I go to Edmonton probably every year. So I have a soft spot for Edmonton. Oh, good. Do you miss us? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> in the summer, maybe he does. Oh, good. Uh, what I'd like to do now, we're about at our halfway point, and we haven't talked about this beautiful liquid that's in front of us. And Nick is one of my fast fastest best noses out there so i'm gonna put nick on the spot we're gonna have nick tell us what she has and then blair i'd, I'd like to hear from you because i i think you're more into the, the the i don't know if i want to say the blends but the cocktails and i i'm i'm vastly illiterate when it comes to cocktails and how to actually develop it. And in your drink tonight, you decide to do a cocktail. So yeah. I want to see if your perception differs from the type of thing that this whiskey guy does. So All if right. I could do that. So Nick, you're up. Let's make you big. Um, this is actually my second time of tasting this. And it's kind of interesting coming back to it. I tasted this back in January uh, when it first hit the Alberta market and I found it really hot and the nose had kind of actually turned me off at that point but I think having the education of seven weeks with Davin and, and drinking a lot of Canadian um, readjusted my palate to it so it's really it's an interesting nose I get a lot of um, dried corn husk off of it um and a soft white pepper, which is really interesting for a rye. 
And I guess my question to Gordon is, what's the mash bill on this? Like, is this all 100% rye? Because I did not look anything up on it tonight. And we usually do before we talk about our whiskeys. We find out some stuff. Yeah, so so it is. It's it's hundred uh, percent uh, northern BC rye. Yeah, it okay. says that right up there. Distilled with hundred, and I, I'm kind of there with Nick a little bit because it felt. It does feel like there's corn because it's so soft and it's so creamy. So that that's where I was thinking in it before I saw that. So Blair, your perception, please, kind sir. Um, I I personally love this whiskey. Um, it's got uh, uh, like tons of rye grain notes. Um, I really like the stone fruit in it. Um, it plays off wonderfully with uh, they have a they uh, Oz Society, these uh, Gordon hasn't talked about it yet, but um, their moot vermouth is fantastic. Let's get that focus in here. Well, we got um, some pictures of that to put that on later. We're good, yeah. So, Perfect. I I find the stone fruits uh, really balance out with the rye. Um, and when you start introducing, uh, uh, vermouth, uh, some cherry bitters, uh, I put some cherry hearing in this, uh, cocktail to, um, to pull out some of that, that character out of it. Um, but I think in a, in a cocktail, this is like a home run, this whiskey. Excellent. Thank you very much. And that's a great way to describe it. Davin, you're up. You're on the spot. Sorry. Well, you know, first I should say that Blair wrote all of the tasting notes in our book, at least the first draft and pretty much everything he tasted, he's got a great palate. I, in addition to what we've heard so far, I'm getting honey on this right away. Okay. I'm getting get something like beeswax or, or honeycomb, something like that, you know, the two of them yeah. on that. Um, I, I find it a bit spicy and I'm getting like that soft lemon curd that you get in a jar that you spread on, on toast or something like that. I'm getting some lemon notes as well. I have to say, I think that the the, the uh, new distillers in Canada are just really taking rye and really getting more out of it. Uh, this is nothing like American rye, which is what most people think of when they think of rye whiskey. And and, and it's uh, you know it's nothing like the, the the great ryes that are coming out of uh, out of Alberta distillers, for example. You know, like Masterson's and you know Whistlepig and stuff like that. This is it really takes rye in a new direction. That's one of the things that I like about the, some of the Ontario distilleries is they're they're also getting these citrus notes. Um, I really quite enjoy this this uh, this whiskey. It's uh, it, it's, <coughs> it's ready to drink, and I'm I'm glad it's one of your of your regular whiskeys, uh, Gordon, because I, I think that it's got a lot to offer. Nice. I'm going to hold that up so people can see it. Prospect, yeah, hold it yeah, up. Let's not that. forget. It's okay. a beautiful bottle. Well, um, you know, part of what we what we were trying to do was, um, you know, if you go to, into the the definition of, of Canadian rice, you know, there's no like in the U.S. they specify. You know, 51% rye. If you, you know, for for if you want to call it a rye, you know, for certain, they're very defined about the quantities of a certain grain that you need. You know, if if, if you want a bourbon, it's 51% corn. So Canada, we're not like that. And, and so I wanted to, we wanted to create something that was, you know, unequivocal, exactly. So we went 100% rye. You know, 100% BC rye, and we thought, okay, let's just focus on the rye and 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 see what the rye gives us, and yeah, and and we're quite happy. And so, and rye, of course, is known for for its, its spiciness. So, mm -hmm. what we did in our production was, because it's 100% rye, we thought we would balance that with um, brand new wood. So, so this rye is aged in um, in in brand new brand new barrels. So. So that's kind of how we want to bring that balance is, is, is virgin wood and 100% rye. And how charred is it, Gordon? So we um, we do a bit of experimenting with char, but it's char level three, you know, which is just sort of the standard bourbon char. Um, yeah. Nice. And Gordon, go ahead, Nick. I was going to say, Gordon, is it new American oak or Canadian oak? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, brand new, it's American oak. Okay. Yeah, American white oak. Beautiful. And I just have to put this picture on. Go ahead, Devin, because Devin sent this to me. It's a beautiful picture. <laughs> He's experimenting Definitely. with the camera. It's, it's, it looks great, doesn't it? 
Yep, that's what I'm sitting in front of right now, that exact spot. <laughs> Gordon, and, you're, doing, uh, you're doing experiments with all kinds of things at your distillery, and you told me that, that because you're a scientist, uh, you know, you've got a master's from Harriet Watt, that, that it wasn't just random that you were actually planning things. So one of the things I seem to remember seeing when I was at your distillery at Odd Society was some of these honeycomb barrels. I'm remembering yeah. that correctly, am I? Yeah. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about those because I, I've been fascinated by them since. Yeah. So um, there's a, a cooperage in, in um, I believe it's Minnesota, um, called Black Swan, and um, what they did was they came up with a method of creating their barrels. So um, every second stave is is re-drilled. So they, it looks like when, when you look at a barrel, it looks like honeycomb, you know, there's holes. And so uh, the barrels that we're using were, were uh, 30 liter barrels with re-drilled staves. So the amount of wood contact that you get with the spirit is, is over the top. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and so um, they're trying to speed up aging, but you just get um, a lot of a lot out of the wood that you wouldn't normally. So um, th that's what they're calling their honeycomb barrels. All okay. right. <laughs> that's a great question, Devin. I wish I saw that. Uh, I would have gotten a picture of that one. I would, I, I've got one of the distillery, but nothing in the background. Oh, yeah. And and this on if uh, Google Earth is where I got that picture. I know I've seen several of them, but I thought Google Earth is trying to give them a shout out because I'm stealing their stuff. But <laughs> yeah. and. Uh, my my little note on this before we go to you, Gordon, is uh, you you keep talking about honeycomb. Davin said it, but uh, the honeycomb itself it starts sweet for me, but the taste oh, yeah. of wax on it, I get that, and because it's better than what I was thinking before. And please don't take offense to this, but babies' diapers, as you pull them out, brand new, there's a certain smell to them. And I smelled one just recently with a friend who was changing their child. And it, it brought back good memories to me. And that kind of had a bit of the smell to it. And that's what that is. It, it's the wax. So it's not something that would ever go on someone's tasting notes. But it was a fantastic experience. And it brought me to this right when I had it. So whatever it takes to make me love your spirit, there we go. It's almost like <laughs> a floral yeah. note. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, that 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 I know what you're talking about when you open a, ba a box of pampers. Yeah, it's yeah, like a like a, a floral yeah. perfumed uh, note that um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't describe it that way, but <laughs> but thank yeah, you yeah. for backing yeah. me up, buddy. I need some. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Jordan, uh, are we missing out on something that you intended us to the taste that maybe we're brushing over or kind of skimming by? No, I I am. Um, well, it's funny when I. When when um, when I'm tasting our whiskeys, I, I uh, I'm always focusing on on faults and and so um, I always try to describe it. Oh, so I find it kind of clean and not you know there's certain things that we get in in whiskeys is like you know like soapiness if you're taking it down too far in the distillation and all that. So so okay. I'm getting none of that. So I'm I'm we're really pleased with with this one and and how it's come out. Um, and and what I like about rye, I mean, in general, you know, it, it it's just that that the spiciness, and there's lot there's lots of that rich spiciness that, that you get at the end that that really helps when you're when you're you and and the way most people use rye, of course, is in cocktails. So so um, we're really happy with what this what what happens when it's in a cocktail. Well, I really appreciate the mouthfeel as well. I talked about it a bit at the first, but I, I do like it. It's creamy. It's a little bit oily. I love the. And I love my rye, so this is this right up my alley. I'm glad you suggested it, Gordon, for us tonight. It's a good suggestion. Yeah, the, uh, the only fault I found in mine uh, is that I bought the 375 milliliter size instead of the 750. <laughs> um, <laughs> besides that, I love it. I and I'm gonna be uh, yeah. I'm an idiot. I shouldn't have done you. that. Well, mine would be gone if that was the case. It would be oh, I'd be horrible. <laughs> exactly. It'd be horrible. Gordon. Uh, yes. You said you have a lot of local support with Davin and Blair's book going across country. 
do you feel the pressure to try and produce more to get your spirit out across Canada or are you staying pretty much focused in Vancouver and the local area? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we would love to, I mean, we're, we're actually um, in Alberta, you know, we've started, uh, it's available in Alberta and, and now we have an online store, but we would love to um, expand and, we do a lot of whiskeys and this is the one that we make sure we're we're making quantities enough that we can we can start to to go outside of um bc um we're looking we just had a someone out of the blue uh, from france ask us if they if we're willing to ship to there so so we're working on getting our first shipment um to europe so which would be pretty exciting for us so so we definitely want to expand and and um yeah no question do I remember a sensational Salal gin? <laughs> no, do I? I, yeah. I I'm sorry. I yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So we we do um, we do a lot of unusual things. Um, it, it was our version of slow gin, so we had oh, all right, yeah. like, yeah. uh, the Salal gin from 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 the Haida Gwaii and and you know Prince Rupert and uh, along the coast and stuff. So and then that goes instead of slow berries, we use Salal berries. Yeah, so that's another one of our unusual ones. But that one we won't be able to produce enough to sort of go anywhere else. Uh, just because it gets up pretty quickly. Uh, are you anywhere near the hundred thousand liters to get you over or out of the craft market? Is um, that a worry by going outside of uh, no, BC? No, we're not there yet for sure, um, and um, we're we're probably more like. I guess we probably do about 30,000 liters a year. Um, yeah. But there's also talk now, and, and I think you 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 may talk to Tyler Schramm, I think is part of the, part, part, um, um, I mean, I mean Tyler, um, yeah, the two Tylers from, from the BC Distillers Guild. So there's a lot of um, lobbying the government to try and raise that um, 100,000 liters. So I think in the next couple of years, you're going to see that ceiling being raised because there's a um, a few really great local distilleries that have already reached that level and um, they're pushing to have that raised. So, so I think you're going to see that happen. So slowly, um, you know, EC distilleries are going to get bigger and still be considered craft. Well, good for them for, for making it to yeah. the hundred thousand liters. Uh, Carl's got a question. It's right there on the screen. Is the blender's release age similar to the prospector? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, so I had briefly mentioned one of my colleagues who became the blender for McAllen and is now um, the whiskey uh, blender for the Lakes Distillery in, in England. So he's the one who came and we had a big workshop with 12 distillers around the province and he took us through you know how they, how they blend whiskey. So we released it what's called the blender's release. And yes, so the blender's release was um, a blend of different barrels that were around three and a half years old. Yeah, so that's similar to the prospect. Um, right. As we as as odds as we get older, our whiskeys are getting older. So our next prospector will be probably more like four years old because we've got the barrels aging. Yeah. You don't really taste youth on this whiskey, though. It doesn't have sorry. That, you don't really taste youth on this whiskey. It doesn't have the little grassy notes. You know? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're using um, um, new barrels, oh, yeah. and also um, a lot of our barrels are what we call half barrels. They're thirty U.S. gallons, so they're one hundred thirteen liters. So they're 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 smaller barrels. So yeah. Now we're hoping that people are going to watch this <clears throat> and be inspired when the pandemic is over to get out and actually do some touring. We're hoping for a cross Canada tour. Uh, and <clears throat> I noticed that uh, there are, you're quite close to some several other distilleries. So if people were to visit Odd Society, they could, for example, go to the woods or they could go yeah. to, to uh, Resurrection and- uh, Resurrection, yeah, it's all, um so we have about six distillery. We have six distilleries in Vancouver. So we're we're like Resurrections a couple blocks away. Um, they're sons of Vancouver. Um, oh, they're yeah. just over in Vancouver. They're about you know ten minutes away. Woods is is right beside Sons of Vancouver. 
Um, there's Liberty Distillery on Grand Bell Island. And, oh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, there's Long Table right downtown. So we've got a lot of, a lot of, and, and it's all very close for sure. And then if you like beer too, like we're um, within five, within 12 blocks. Uh, I mean, within six blocks, we have 12 breweries. So, nice. <laughs> you know, you can you call them stumbling tours. You know, people are just going around and. Oh, I would do that tour in a second. Uh, and because Davin probably doesn't want to toot his horn. I'm going to say in there on page 32 is where you guys are in this book. And Davin and Blair have the nearest neighbors. So Resurrection Spirits, and this gives the page one minute away. Uh, the Wood Spirit. Sons of Vancouver, and it gives you an amount of time that you could actually take. And I'm assuming it's walking, or is it, or is it driving, Davin? Someone's that driving. driving. Oh yeah, driving. I was, I was driving, but uh, yeah, but yeah, you could easily walk. Perfect. Yeah, if you're um, going to have a drink, you might want to cycle or you know, I don't know, Uber or something. I'll someone <laughs> drive us. That's okay. Yeah. That's the way to do it. Blair, Nick, yep. Blair and Davin, what was your first sort of? feel as you walked into this distillery what stood out for you and what is sort of your key moment after doing a, a stop at odd society what stands oh, out for you odd society um it's long and narrow it has a wonderful bar out front with a beautiful illustration on the wall Fa a phantasmagoric illustration behind the oh. bar I noticed that it was very narrow. Yeah, oh, there is right there. And um, I was really impressed by uh, one of the staff who worked there. He's a, a tall guy with a big, long beard and just really seemed to be right into what he was doing. I think he, he had been late for work that day and took a long lunch, so he was planning on going home early. And, uh, no, it was really quite a casual atmosphere. I really loved it. And I thought the, 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 the distillery is... I mean, it's a distillery. You just you saw that picture with the stills and all the things on the side, but uh, it looks to me. I, the what I remember is long and narrow. I remember those those honeycomb barrels, and I remember uh, how when you, when you walked in the front door, uh, that uh, you know, there's this this nice welcoming bar there, and it, we walked all the way through right out to the back. You know, back it's a parking lot, you know, for a commercial parking lot and things like that. But uh, did, uh, am I remembering you correctly, Gordon? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're we're definitely long and narrow for sure. Yeah. And then we go to the back. The, the, the rail the, the rail lines there and the port is is out back. In, yeah, in the backyard. Yeah, for sure. To piggyback yeah, yeah. on that question, uh, Blair, were you able to go to this distillery? Because I know that Davin did BC and you did Ontario, but you both got together for stuff as well. So I'm wondering if you were able to get Vancouver under your belt. No, we did uh, Vancouver Island together. Mm. Um, when Davin was at Odd Society, I think I was at Hiram Walker that day. It was around the same same time. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. So not quite the same uh, scale, right? <laughs> no. Oh, Hiram Walker. <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, it's long and wide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, all, and deep. <laughs> uh, Gordon, I'm really interested in how you started the distillery, but really specifically, I, I love my whiskey. Was whiskey your initial design, or did you want to? You said rum, but I'm wondering if rum was your first choice that you thought you were going to make. No, I mean, actually, um, like when I was in Scotland, uh, or even before, whiskey was whiskey was the goal. Um, and then a couple of things happened. Well, first of all, it's kind of reality. You know, when you have a distillery, whiskey takes a long time. You know, like we are on a fairly small scale. So we started doing vodka and, and gins and all these other things. Um, but whiskey was, was always, um, sort of the driving factor behind the, the distillery and what we wanted to do. Yeah. Okay. No question. And what type of, how did you decide on a flavor profile? Is it something that you loved at one point or th something you thought was more marketable? I'm, I'm really trying to wrap my head around as you're starting. What's yeah, your you, at, you know, um, as we're starting, 
we we just kind of we we weren't sure to tell you the honest truth we well you know we didn't have peated malt and we didn't have the idea of, of what we do now so it's kind of space i'd like you know we'll try it you know but it was just kind of and kind of where we're at now we still haven't really defined ourselves i think our our our, our big defining kind of ethos is, is almost experimentation you know we're we're doing some pretty unusual things um and then ultimately i think it will lead us to to where we want to be but you know i think i think there is a kind of a taste with a, you know if you've tasted a lot of our stuff there's a certain recognizable flavor you know that, that binding that, that comes out of it and um so but for example we're we're now trying you know smoke malt we've done um, big leaf that. maple arbutus wood um uh, um garyana oak instead of peat you know and those are all local trees that we we re-smoke the malt with these smokes and then we've done a raw malt you know which is um, uh, typically beech wood oh. so and then i think when those come we're trying to search for the, the perfect bc smoked malt you know and and the beef smoked bc whiskey which is what we're aiming for so um we're still i think it's still a journey to be honest we're okay. looking for that, that flavor so you don't have uh, an aim for your whiskey in 5 10 20 years it, you're just kind of you're flowing I, I with what feels right yeah we're 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 looking for that we're, we're working on Sorry, Gordon, we froze you again. Oh, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, we're looking for that flavor. You know, we're going to compare the four smoked whiskeys okay. and then find which one we really like and then go with that one. You know what I mean? So, you know, seven, eight years is a long time, but in the whiskey world, we're still in our infancy. Well, I really admire you and Davin and Blair. You're in an industry and you get to be creative continually. I don't know. I'm, I'm really in awe of everyone here. <laughs> Sorry, I want your jobs, all of you. So, <laughs> fantastic. I got to say teaching's great, but you make it sound fantastic, guys. Uh, I'm going to say one last thing. Uh, two really quick questions for you, Gordon. What which one of your spirits gives you the most joy to create? Do you have one of them? I don't know if that's a good question or not. Um, well, I know, well, I think it's whiskey for sure. And I know my, my absolute, oh, the crap. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. I actually, Anyway, to finish with the, one of my favorite days, one of my favorite activities, whenever we're doing anything, is barreling whiskey. It's okay. just there's just when we're when we've done distilling and we're putting it in barrels, there's something unbelievably satisfying, and there's a, there's hope. There's there's you know yeah, there's hope for the future, and and it's it's just why we got into it for me anyway, when, when I'm barreling whiskey, I'm just really happy, you know, cause I, I, I just try to imagine what this is going to be down the road. You know? The hope related to it. That's a fantastic comment. I'm going to hold on to that for a while. I think <laughs> I like that a lot. Uh, yeah. No, I, 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 sorry. I, I was just going to say something quickly about, you know, a lot of what we've done has been shaped by the, the changing rules. And, and when we first opened our bar, um, you weren't allowed to, to serve any other outside alcohol and we wanted to do cocktails. So we said, well, we need vermouth for cocktails. Okay, let's make our own vermouth. So we had to get a winery license to make vermouth and ended up making vermouth. But that was a real pleasure because we initially intended it just to be for the bar. And then we thought, oh, you know, there maybe there'll be a few people like it, but there's been because it's there's been this huge uptake for our vermouth, which kind of mm -hmm. shocked us. And 
Yeah, I have a soft spot for the vermouth just because of where it's taken us. Yeah. All right. Uh, in the last eight years, you've been open eight years now. Do you have something that stands out as the most satisfying time? Something that you are so terribly proud of, or if you were looking back, your heart just swells because of that moment. Um, I think one of the moments was again talking about vermouth. We 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 did a barrel aged vermouth. Just okay. oh, yeah. and another of those weird things where we we um, we were at the end of a bottling run. We had some left. I think we ran out of bottles, so we threw it in a barrel, and then. We okay. put it away, and then a year later, it was about a year later. We we pulled. We, there's that vermouth, and so we tried it, and we loved it, and we we entered it in uh, the New York um, World Wine World and Spirits Competition, and we won um, best in class, best vermouth at New York. <laughs> and that was that was just. But we, you know, we haven't replicated that. But it was just one of those moments that holy crap, you know. <laughs> things, things just just lead to something really cool and so and we're hoping you know when we do our whiskey some of these smoked whiskeys that something like that's going to happen mm -hmm. all right fantastic well ladies and gentlemen my malt brothers and my malty sisters my whiskey brothers and sisters i shouldn't i shouldn't take ralphie's line i'm sorry my whiskey brothers and sisters it's been a fantastic start to our evening Thank you to the listeners. Thank you to the panel. It's been, Gordon, Davin, Blair, Nicole. It's been absolute pleasure being with you guys tonight. Uh, we're going to continue our whiskey book club, Canadian whiskey journey in the after dram with Miriam. She's going to come on the manager of the odd society spirits and Gordon's wife. So uh, I, we're moving our conversation from the distillery tour to the tasting room for a more relaxed and equally engaging conversation. So David and co-author Blair are of course going to be there with us with the book. I got to show you the book. Oh. The Definitive Guide to Canadian Distillery, <laughs> a portable expert to over 200 distilleries and the spirits they make. A mouthful, I got to tell you. There we go. Because what yeah. better summer activity is there than traveling virtually but and trying cocktails and i'm going to do this for the first time really cocktails and spending time with fantastic people so please join us in about five minutes in the after dram and if you don't want to miss a minute of the next 14 weeks of this and the after dram subscribe just down 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 there on the bottom just click that little button otherwise Thank you all very much, and I'll see you all in about five minutes. Shall Thanks we? Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Gordon. And Thanks, cheers. Bye.